Let it be known by all Europeans that America has at least one castle. That is Grey Towers Castle in Glenside, Pennsylvania, just north of Philadelphia. The story of this castle starts in 1893, when a mansion on this very same spot, Rosedale Hall, burned down in a fire. The mansion belonged to a Mr. William Harrison. No, not Henry. Welsh. William Welsh Harrison. William was a wealthy man who inherited a large amount of money from his father, who made his fortune in the sugar industry, and so lived on a large estate in a large mansion. So what do you do when you have a huge piece of land, a huge pile of money, and an empty spot where your mansion used to be? Well, you build a bigger, more impressive one, of course, or rather you pay people to do it for you. The architect that was hired was Horace Trumbauer, a budding talent who also designed several public buildings around the Philly area, and later went on to design residential mansions in Philly, New York, and Washington, D.C. What he designed was a building modeled after Alnwick Castle in North England. Alnwick was the ancestral seat of the Duke of Northumberland, but more than that, it would later inspire the architecture in a certain timeless beloved movie series. This extravagant building would take five years to construct, being finished in 1898, during which time the Harrison family lived in the gatehouse on the estate, the place where visitors would traditionally be greeted. The total cost of the castle was estimated to be about half a million dollars, which in today's money is about 13 million. There is a bill on record from William Baumgarten, a tapestry company in New York, for 50,000, just for tapestries. The castle finished, the Harrison family lived on the estate for almost 20 years. In 1927, Mr. Harrison died. Now, this is where the story gets exciting. There was an all-girls university called Beaver College that was previously located in Beaver, Pennsylvania, but had recently moved to Jenkintown, just down the road from the estate. The board of trustees for the school, with visions of a glorious future floating around in their heads, bought the estate from the widow for 712000 and made plans to gradually move all their campus operations to the new piece of land. The school chugged along through the 30s, mostly stagnating. In 1939, Dr. Raymond Kistler took over the university president's position and inherited a slightly murky financial situation. And then Pearl Harbor happened. All across the country, young men were going off to war, young women were going into factories, and hardly anyone was looking for higher education. In the early 40s, the school almost closed. In fact, every year was a battle to stay open. It took a lot of fundraising and a lot of personal donations from the Board of Trustees, made in blind faith, to keep the place running. Mr. Kistler probably saved the place. After the budget crisis was solved, however, the campus started growing. The end of the war improved enrollment again, and gradually, after more school functions were moved to the Grey Towers estate, the Jenkintown campus was closed, and the Castle campus, the Glenside campus, became the sole home of Beaver College. For reference, here's an aerial photo of the area from 1930, where you can see the castle, the greenhouse, now a parking lot, the stables, now an art and music building, and the powerhouse, now an art and theater building. The aforementioned gatehouse is located down the path, off camera to the right. Compare this to a view of the same area from 1962, after a classroom building, a library, and several dorm halls were constructed. The castle was designated a National Historic Landmark in 1985, and since then, a few new buildings were constructed around it. As the campus grew, the students' love for the castle grew with it. In fact, a whole student group sprung up around it called the Society for Castle Restoration, a club founded for the purpose of fundraising for projects around the castle. Well, I did gather a lot of information from this book. The most interesting information I have about the castle comes from the Society of Castle Restoration. These people have an interesting way of preserving what they know, which is they pass oral history down through the generations of club members. So the people who are seniors now are telling the same stories to younger members that they were told when they first joined the club. As the story goes, Mr. and Mrs. Harrison had a daughter, Geraldine, who was a small child at the time the castle was finished. Mr. and Mrs. were also not fond of each other. The tour guides are able to explain how the castle was divided into two halves, one for each of them, so they never had to see each other. And they give examples of how the art and decoration in the castle reflected this. They also talk about a secret network of tunnels in and out of the castle that Mr. Harrison used as a safe entrance and exit for his mistresses. These tunnels do indeed exist, however many of them were destroyed in the process of constructing various buildings on the campus, and the few that remain are deemed unsafe for common use. SCR members can recite countless colorful stories about the family's life in the castle, including silent dinners at which the loving couple hatefully stared each other down. Stories of servants getting tortured, stories about Geraldine's friends that would come to visit from time to time, and a bunch of other fun stuff. This group hosts multiple fundraising events every year, but their busiest time of year is October, the month when they prepare for the annual Haunted Castle. And they also offer ghost tours to students, community members, and whoever wants to come. 
The ghost stories, in fact, have had a sizable impact on student culture. Speaking of ghost stories, I actually got a few on camera. So behind me is the door to the Red Room. When the Harrisons lived in this castle, that was Mr. Harrison's smoking room. So Mr. Harrison would go in there, he would smoke all day, and then he would come out and, as he would, have sex with his mistresses. Mr. Harrison had many mistresses. The only rule was that you could never have them in the castle itself. However, Mrs. Harrison caught him once with her best friend, her lady's maid, she's known her since she was born, and it's the one and only time that Mrs. Harrison ever uh, ordered a punishment. So she had the lady's maid taken into Mr. Harrison's smoking room and whipped. Unbeknownst to anybody doing it at the time, the maid had a blood disorder which caused her to bleed out from the weapon. And we know this is absolutely true because the lady maid's daughter has told us so. It, like it's on records and everything. So, the blood was all over the walls and normally that would not be a bad thing. They would just wash it off the walls and everything would be fine. However, when the next day when Mr. Harrison came in to go do some smoking again, uh, the walls were still blood red. So, he uh, had them washed down again, painted over it in white. Next day, blood red again. So, Eventually, they just painted the entire room blood red, and it is the only room in the entire campus that is that atrocious shade of red. There are other things that are maroon, but nothing else is blood red. So, years later, when the castle was being used for dormitories, an RA was in there because it is a very nice room, it's circular, red. Uh, so the RA was in there, and she was a very bubbly person. And about halfway through the fall semester, she stopped going to check in on her first year students. So they came, got public safety, went in to check on her, and found her hanging um, with blood drawn, like coming from her. Once they uh, take care of the RA and make everything back to normal, they turn the room into an office. For years, there was a woman in there who would not let you talk about the story of the Red Room at all. She would, like, duct tape people's masks would not hear a thing of it. Uh, she has now moved out and it's somebody else's office. But there was somebody who tried an experiment with it. They got like one of those um, tape recorders and put it under the door to the red room and closed the door and left it there overnight and retrieved it in the morning to see if they were, could record something inside the room at night. And they did. Uh, what was on the tape was a recording of the ghost uh, telling the tape to kill itself, that it was worthless, just words edging it on to commit suicide. Things that were referenced in the RA suicide book. So, uh, the tape was promptly destroyed, unfortunately, but that is the one story that we know for a fact is true.